Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast and our special series, How to Get Started with Bees, sponsored by Better Bee, your partners in better beekeeping. I'm Jeff Ott. I'm Kim Flottam. And I'm Jim too. Hey guys, Beekeeping Today podcast is proud to welcome the folks at Better Bee as a beginning beekeeping series sponsor. Better Bee's mission is to support every beekeeper with excellent customer service, continued education, and quality equipment. Just how? Well, many of their employees are also beekeepers who know your needs, challenges, and answers to your beekeeping questions. From the colorful and informative Better Bee Catalog to the support of beekeeper education, including this podcast series, Better Bee truly is beekeepers serving beekeepers. See for yourself at www.betterbee.com. Today's episode is also brought to you through the continued support of the great folks at Global Patties. Global Patties is a family-owned company that has been in business for over 18 years, making protein supplement patties for honeybees. Global offers a variety of standard patties using a time-tested recipe of natural ingredients, with or without real pollen, as well as custom patties to meet any specific needs. Feeding your colony's protein supplement patties will help them grow by increasing brood production and increasing overall honey flow. Keep your bees going all season long by supplementing with Global Patties. Find out more at their website, www.globalpatties.com. We want to thank our regular sponsors, Bee Culture, Global Patties, and Two Million Blossoms for their continued support of our podcast and welcome Better Bee as the How to Get Started with Bees series sponsors. Better be beekeepers serving beekeepers. Hey guys, welcome back. It's been a busy couple of weeks getting started, uh, getting ready to get started with bees. Uh, the first episode of this, how to get started with bees, we talked about location, we talked about equipment, we talked about uh, placement, and neighbors. The second episode, we talked uh, uh, a little bit more about equipment. We talked about the races of bees. We talked about types of bees and the casts. Uh, and uh, ordering bees, and where do you get them? Today, you get that call from the post office, and your bees are ready, and you have to go down and pick them up. Where do we go from there? That's a good question, and it's always one of those uh, high adrenaline moments in your life when you're getting started. And if whether you're going to the post office to get them or you're going over to your local supplier with the other 200 beekeepers in your county, to pick them up because they came in last night on a truck doesn't make any difference. The adrenaline's it's an adrenaline rush, and uh, a couple things to think about is how you're going to get them home, and and that's one thing a lot of people don't think about. Oh, I'll just throw them in the back seat. Well, maybe. <laughs> why can't why well, and maybe not? Yeah, why can't you just throw them in the back seat? Have 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 your have your son or daughter hold them in their lap, or your wife or spouse. <laughs> Yeah, that'll be a short trip. <laughs> uh, what you're going to want to do is have something. There's going to be some bees on the outside, almost guaranteed, and and you want to you want to make sure that they're not going to get in your car. If you got a pickup, that's one thing. They're going to be outside. You just uh, keep them out of the wind. But if they're going to be in the back seat of your car or your or your SUV, uh, once they get out or once they decide to leave the package, and they probably won't much because i got bees or I've got a place I don't know. They're going to stick close to home. But if they do fly, they're going to go to a window. Mm. And and where's the window? And so one of the things I always re- recommend is if you're going to have to put them inside your car is to throw a piece of uh, like nylon netting over them. You just have, all you have to do is just cover them. And that should get you home. You don't have to put them in a bag. You don't have to lock them up. Just throw a piece of nylon covering over him so that if one does decide to leave, she's going to go up and she's going to run into the nylon and she'll be there when you get home. I guess the the, the big point there is make sure it's breathable so that they don't suffocate and or overheat. Yeah. Yep, nylon netting. It's stuff you can see through. They're not, they're not really coming for you. I mean, everything you said, Kim, I agree with. But just so you know, they're, they're not really trying to get to you and to admonish you for being a poor driver or a bad (laughs) ride or whatever. They're just going to maybe drop down your collar or something accidental, and then you're driving. And so 
it's not a bad idea if you're new to all this to keep your mind on the road and don't be distracted by bees flying around while you try to swat them. So like you said, cover them up, contain them, put them in the back of the truck, put them up close to the cab. Mm -hmm. So just use common sense. They're pretty hardy. I found in the car, if they get out in the car, uh, they just go to the window. They don't really tend to, at least the ones I've experienced, not flying around too much. They just crawl around the window edges and try to figure out what's going on. But if you've never had bees in your car, it could be pretty unnerving. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, just that, that's just one, one, one of life's experiences you can avoid easily. So, well, all right. Yeah. Before I went to get my bees, Jim... Okay. What kinds of things are you getting ready? What are you doing before those bees arrive? Well, just me personally, I, I definitely want a home set up for them. I'd like everything out in the bee yard good to go. Everything's already done. I've, we're going to talk about hive stands here in a bit, but I've made my decision on hive stands. I've got the box there. And depending on the weather, I'm good to go. So when I get them home straight away, I'm going to atomize them with a little bit of uh, sugar water just to give them a snack, make them feel welcome at their new home here. Put them in a dark place, calm them down. What do you do, Kim, if you don't have a basement? What do you do, Jeff, if you don't have a basement? I always go to the basement or put them in a cool area, but what if you're in a warm climate and you, there really is no basement? I suppose just find the coolest, darkest place you can until the rain stops or until you get off work or whatever. Yeah, I've always. And that's what I've done. I've always had a basement. A garage is work. Uh, mm -hmm. you keep the door closed and keep them out of the. Don't put them where the sun's going to shine. You don't want them overheated, certainly. And even if you don't have a place to put them, you know, and close them in the shade of the, you know, the side of your house or someplace. And one of the things I've seen done that works pretty well is you just set them as close to the foundation as you can, and you put a a, a couple of big boards slanted so that. Um, the light isn't coming in at them directly. And hey, Kim, can can I quote you on that? Put your bees where the sun don't shine. Is that <laughs> did I hear? Did I hear you say that properly? You did. <laughs> I'm, I'm not getting involved in this. You two are on your own. <laughs> All right. I just want to make sure that we got that right. I will get you for that, Jeff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be tough to do because he's the editor of this piece. So. Uh, well, you're right. Okay. Yeah, anything that you can do, if you got to keep them outside to keep direct sunlight uh, yeah. off from them, uh, is, is going to help. And, and if you've got to wait until tomorrow, then and you don't have a garage or a basement to put in, then just make that, that, that enclosure, that shade, a little more secure. Because it's kind of hard telling. You got neighborhood kids, you got skunks, you, got, you don't know what might go bothering them. But first choice basement, second choice garage, third choice secured outside. And I keep them up on a workbench or a tabletop so that they can't, they're out of the draft and uh, off the floor for where the animals, pests can get to them. I don't know about you two, but this is just me personally. But no matter where you put them, they make that hum. And the warmer they get, when you turn the lights on, they ratchet it up two or three levels. And it it just makes me itchy to think that those things are trapped, they're confined. I'm kind of antsy about it. I want to get them out. I want to let them go. And the rain's still coming or something's holding me up. But there's a, a sense of urgency that I can't shake until I finally get those things out. So I... Well, put that out there just in case you're feeling it now. Do it, turn them loose now, let it go down, do this now, or just wait a while. Can I do it now? Can I do it now? No, that's, for me, that's a pretty standard feeling all these years later. Well, I'm going yeah. to interrupt you here for a minute, Jim, because lately I've heard people talk about doing a pre-installation mite treatment, and I've never done one. Uh, have you got any experience with that? Is that something that that that's becoming standard procedure, or and and I don't know if I'm, I'm going to guess that if you've got a mentor or you belong to a group or taking a beginner's class, you're at least going to hear it mentioned. It, what's involved with that? Do you do you know? Well, I've not done it personally, 
Jeff, have you or am I on my own here? Or was you, Kim and I on our own here? No, actually, I've done it uh, the last two seasons. Um, the, the the only challenge with that is the recommendation that after you treat them, uh, you spray you spray them with oxalic acid uh, solution uh, to let them rest for seventy two hours, and um, and that can be a challenge because of the same reason, Jim, you were just saying that you want to get them installed, you want to get them flying, let them let them be bees. Yeah. And but with but with the varroa being such a issue these days, it's a great opportunity to get any any of the bees that or any of the varroa that are just climbing around on the on the bees uh, and before they get into the the equipment. The reason I've never done it is that somebody else has been doing the mite treatment for those bees before I got them. So I've always thought, well, they probably had a treatment just a few weeks ago, a few days ago. I don't know when, but the Commercial guy has to treat for sure, but as the varroa is, be- is more and more relentless, I mean it's not it's not changing. I'm just becoming more and more aware. It's always been relentless, but I I don't feel as comfortable as I once did thinking that everything's taken care of and I'm I've got a free couple of months there. But I don't I don't want to put one more thing on the new beekeeper to do. I'm, mm-hmm. It's probably something you want to do. We keep bringing up mentors, and what do you think, Kim? Ask them, the mentor if they want to help with that, what they do locally, what their opinion is. Uh, do it. Don't do it. It's uh, not one in the world either way, but it probably would help some. I guess I'd, if I'm taking a beginner's class, I'm going to ask the people who know what they're teaching. Uh, if I've got a mentor, I'm going to talk to them. It it has to do with where are the bees coming from and what's the history of this uh, bee producer, I think, and and uh, also, where are you? You know, what part of the country are you? And if you're in the south, the world is exploding already. If you're in the north, you've got a little bit of you've got a little bit of a window yet before the bee population explodes. So, I'd ask I'd ask the local people what their exper- experience has been with the producer and with out doing a treatment and with doing a pre treatment and see. See uh, where the crowd, where, where the where the decision gets made, how it gets made, and why. Before I would jump on this, I agree. I want to get them in, but I agree with Jeff. Is that uh, this is something we need to look at? I, I, yeah, I would recommend that if if there, if someone's sitting there by themselves and they have no help and no mentors and they're just reading from books, I would say don't worry about it this year. Yep. Get used. Yeah. You know, get them going. Uh, get them installed. Uh, if you have a mentor or if, if, if uh, you have a buddy you're working with or a friend you're working with, then you might consider it. But uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't stress it right now. The, the thing that I wanted to bring up during the packaging and, and, and installing the hive or installing the packages is no doubt the day after you pick up your bees, it's going to be raining. <laughs> or one time in Colorado, it snowed. Um, the weather will not cooperate when you receive your packages. So if you are set up and planned to be able to keep your bees uh, inside in the packages or, or in the garage or wherever you're going to store them for one or two days after you receive them, you'll, be, you'll do yourself and your bees some good. I've put bees in and when it was snowing, Jeff, in Wisconsin. Uh, not, a, not a good day, let me tell you. No. <laughs> It, the decision was made at 7.30 in the morning to, okay, let's put them in. And we drove out to the bee yard where we were, and it started snowing on the way out there. And by the time we got to the bee yard, you couldn't see across the road, but we were committed. So, interesting day. <sighs> I bet you were committed. You should have been. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't help but believe that a lot of Canadian beekeepers are chuckling at us right now and our weather woes here because I understand they they install packages when by our standards it's just not doable but i can't get off on that i don't have much of experience in helping con- the canadians install their bees in hard weather well jim you mentioned early on uh about what you've got ready you've mentioned the hive stand and and having the hive ready uh what do you mean by that i want everything i want the frames in place and i want the if i'm going to be Shaking them, man. We'll talk about that in a bit. I want the the high position ready to, ready to go. I want the frames out. 
And I got a hive too there, and I won't really need a smoker. I do you use a, anybody use smoke here? You too? I don't ever use smoke on a package. I'm not, I don't use that. But depending if you got the plastic cages or if you've got wooden cages, you need a hive tool to get those things apart, get the lids off, and probably want a pocket knife for dealing with the queen cage in one way or another. Don't release her immediately, but for prying out the staple or the little wire tab that might be holding her, a small pocket knife is handy. And essentially, if the day is good, when I get there, I'll go ahead and release them then. There's nothing. Nothing gained by holding them overnight or holding them longer unless there's a reason for it, weather-wise or schedule-wise. Do you have a preference in uh, what time of day you install them? Yeah, I have a preference. In a perfect world, I'd probably do it around noon or so, so they have the afternoon to settle down. I've been, I have installed them much later in the afternoon, but I'm always <laughs> skittish when I sit there watching TV later at night. Did they find their way in? Did they find a hive anywhere? Or do I have a lot of bees out there spending the night on leaves waiting to find the nest the next morning? So probably I'd like late morning, 10, 30, 11, noon, 2, just to give the bees a chance to find their way around, settle down some, get ready for the night. That's good advice if your schedule, <clears throat> if your schedule allows that. Yep. Um, and, and one other, one other thing, having all that stuff outside. So I get out of the car, I grab the package, I walk to the bee yard, oh, put my veil on my protective gear, of course, uh, get all that ready. But, uh, then I would just walk out and get them in as soon as I can that time of day. But if it's four thirty in the afternoon, maybe I'm going to wait until tomorrow morning. Right. I probably, I probably would. Because if you're shaking them, we haven't discussed that yet, but if you're shaking them out, it's a chaotic moment back there with bees flying all over, and they're going to be taking cleansing flights, so there'll be a little interesting yellow rain coming down on you and your car and whatever else mm -hmm. is close by, so be prepared for that. But it's not the end of the world if you keep them a day or so. Now, if it goes on three, four days Longer, I'm. I would be outright panicky then, and I'd be pushing the envelope on the weather or my schedule or whatever it is. They've probably been. Yeah. They've probably been in that package on the average about two days from the time they got installed in that package at the bee yard of the producer, put on the truck, shipped across the country, taken off the truck late yesterday afternoon, and then you come and get them this morning. So probably maybe three, maybe as many as four days. But but uh, two is, is going to be about the average. So they've been in there two days, 10,000 bees eating all that syrup, waiting to take that cleansing flight, you said. Yeah, so sooner rather than later, if possible. So the process of, of taking that package and, and, and putting them into the hive, and we've already discussed this in a prior episode, uh, we're recommending beginning beekeepers start out with a standard 10-frame Langstroth hive. Um, what's the process of doing that real quick? It's going to be hard to describe that on a podcast, but real briefly, um, uh, maybe we can describe that process and then, um, check the show notes. Maybe there'll, there'll be some videos that we could, uh, that we'll have posted that will sh actually show the process of starting a package. You want to go, Kim? Yeah, there's basically... There's, you know, there's 50 ways to do it. There's basically two ways. Uh, and, and one of them is uh, I've got my 10-frame box. I take the cover off. I take the inner cover off. I take out the middle five frames. And I just set them aside real close. <clears throat> then I open up the package, uh, get the cover loose. And depending on the package I've got, if I've got one of the old wooden ones with the screen or if i got one of the newer plastic ones, it's going to make a little bit of a difference. The newer plastic ones, the end opens. And you can just pry that off with your hive tool, and that's how you get them out of there. Uh, the old uh, wooden screen ones, you have to take the feeder can out and, and uh, let them come out through that feeder can hole or... You can, some people do, I know, they'll just cut the screen and and make the whole side mm. open up. Yeah. That, that's a lot easier on the bees, I think, rather than shaking, rattling, rolling them to get them through that small hole on the top. 
But you want to, what do you do with a queen? At what point do you pull the queen, yeah. the little queen cage out? Before you do any of this, <laughs> is you, you get the feeder can out, depending on where the, feet, the queen is, if you may have to remove the feeder can to get the queen out of the package. On some of the plastic ones, she's actually exposed and you're able just to remove the cage from the top. Uh, mm. So, so, and then, uh, however you get her out of there, if you if you have to open up the package to do it, uh, what they tell you to do is to kind of thump them down on the bottom so that all of the bees are released from the feeder can and the queen fall to the bottom of the cage. You very quickly take the feeder can out, take the queen out, put the feeder can back in, and that way yep. <clears throat> you've got your bees contained and you've got maybe three in the air if you're lucky. If you're lucky. The other instead of putting the feeder can back in. There's that uh, the if it came if your package came with a little uh, the wooden square yeah. over the feeder can just put that on top that way you don't have to yep I've always found in that that wooden package that they get in that feeder can out is probably the most difficult thing <laughs> of the entire operation yeah it, it it fits in there nice and snug and and tight it does yeah it, that way bees aren't getting out nor does the feeder can get out you're right. It's making some engineer very proud of how <laughs> tightly that fits. Well, once you get, once you get the, the, the queen out, you've got the feeder can out, and you either cut the screen in the front or, or you're going to shake them out mm -hmm. through the feeder can hole. Then you've got that cavity in your 10-frame box, and you very slowly and carefully turn the cage over or on its side end and pour the bees right into that cavity in there. And I've seen people bounce them and bang them and... and, and <laughs> just be r really rough, and you don't need to do that. You just need to pour them in there, and you're not going to get them all. Some of them don't want to leave, and usually the best way to handle that is to, once you get most of them out of there, is to simply put that cage in front of the hive, uh, right by the front door, so that the bees that are in the cage on the outside can smell the bees that are on in the hive on the inside, and so, oh, there's home and they'll walk right in. It'll take, uh, and that's why Jim's, Jim's timing for that part of the time of the day is good. If you're doing it 10.30 to noon, 1 o'clock or so, they've got the rest of the day to figure that out, to get out of that cage, get into the hive. It's really simple when you strip everything away. You're basically just opening up the package, either kind, wooden or plastic, and you're doing whatever it takes to get the bees out of there and put that queen in your shirt pocket and that cage so you know where she is, but all, you know, you can make it sound so simple either here or on, the, on a video you might be watching, but when you've got bees flying all around you and you're trying to get that queen out, it's, it is, it's exciting. It's not terrifying. It's not a bad thing for those who've never done it. You don't have to have some kind of gift to do it, but get them out of there. One of the things yeah. to consider, you mentioned bees flying, is to have a Mr. Bottle with that sugar syrup with you. And, and to give them a squirt every once in a while, the bees that you've dumped in, that keeps them from flying. The bees that are in the cage, if you can squirt those just a little bit, it moistens them and makes it hard for them to fly that way. When they fall into the cavity, they stay there. Uh, and what you're missing them with is food. So, um, yeah. you know, yeah. you're giving them a good lunch and you're keeping them from flying as much as you can. You mentioned putting that queen in your shirt pocket. Ever take that queen home with you and get home and... Sit down for supper, and suddenly you've got a buzzing going on in your shirt pocket? <laughs> well, I'd never considered doing that until you suggested it, and I'll probably do it later this spring. But no, I haven't done that yet. <laughs> there are some horror stories. I've had queens just fly away when I tried to release them directly after a few days. That's a philosophical moment where you try to keep up with it. It's a classic Where's Waldo moment. You try to follow her in the air to poof, she's gone. You know, you can release them inside. There's a different way. It requires more equipment, but it's not nearly as, as photographically a, a, of an event. It requires having a second deep. I'd like a deep. You could probably get by with, what do you call it, a Western or a six and five or Illinois depth mm -hmm. or a deep shallow. It's got so many names. But it's right. if everything's right up the same to the point that you start shaking and when you, when you release some quietly, have an empty super of some kind. A deep gives me more room to work. Without shaking the bees out, lay the package on its side. I put the queen right in front where the bees are kind of mounding up. 
coming out of the entrance. Uh, I put the feeder can there. I take the hive tool and knock another little hole or so in it, and I put the feeder can close by and put the inner cover on, put the outer cover on, and then I just cannot leave. I just have to wait those first few bees to come out the entrance because I want to see them, not because I'm concerned, but just because it's a moment I want to see where they come out and expose that nice enough gland and begin to the very first phase of setting up home. Then so you come back. Them, and, you're leaving them on the outside, outside the box. Is that I'm what doing you're telling what? me? You're leaving that, that package outside of the hive. No, I've got an empty deep on there. And I'm putting them in the deep. Thanks for clarifying they're, that if I okay. didn't say that. No, they're definitely inside. It's dark and quiet. And so I don't have them all flying at the same time. So if I'm in a hurry yeah. and I've got a short schedule, I need to get this done. I'm in a distant yard. I'd shake them like crazy. If I'm here at home and I got plenty of time and I want to savor the moment, I'll release them slowly. I don't have as many bees in the air, as many bees having to find the home quickly. But you know, there's good and bad things about both. You got to have extra equipment to release them slowly, and you got to go back the next day and then gently take all that off with the least disturbance possible. By the, just, a, just in one night, the cage will be empty the next morning. If it's not, shake them out. Might be an option if the weather's really bad, yeah. but you need to get them I installed. I have done that when it's raining, just to mm -hmm. not have the bees flying in the rain. One thing we haven't talked about, Jeff, maybe that's what you were going to bring up is <laughs> what do you put that queen? Exactly where I was going. Yeah, because there's sometimes the queen comes with attendants and sometimes not. And so what do you do with the queen with attendants? And what do you do with a candy plug? If it has a candy plug, if it doesn't have a candy plug on the queen cage, uh, let's talk about that real quick because that can cause some consternation. Yep. Kim, you want it? Well, <clears throat> um, uh, the one thing you want to do is make sure that when you put that queen in the cage, you're going to put her between two frames, probably towards the top of the box. And you want to, depending on the kind of cage she comes in, all, every year there's something new out there. But you want to make sure that <laughs> there is at least one surface in that queen cage that is exposed so that the bees can get to her and feed her. Uh, if you've got the three-hole cage, that's one thing. If you've got the little white plastic one, uh, and, and then now there's another a little plastic one, but somehow she's got to be in there so bees can get to her and feed her for the three or four days it takes for her to get released. So that's one thing to consider. Jeff, you mentioned that that candy plug, and and mm -hmm. there's a couple of schools of thought going on here about about queen acceptance taking longer than it used to, and I'm not sure I'm not sure exactly if that's exactly correct or not. But there are there are there's a school of thought going on that queen should be in that cage five or six days, and then there are is a school of thought that said I want to, I want her out of there almost as soon as I can get her out of there. Where Jim Jeff, where do you go with this? I like go ahead, Jeff. You go first. Yeah, yeah, I'll go with the 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 hobbyist approach. I I just go with uh, what way I learned way back when, and that's just uh, I install it with the uh, the the candy side up. And, and and between two frames with the the screen facing to the front or the rear of the hive, and um, yeah, with the candy side up, and let them eat through the candy. If there's no candy in there, uh, pulling that little cork is is always a challenge too. Without skewing the the stabbing the queen if you're trying to poke something through there. But then I I use a marshmallow. So I go, even if there's no candy with the queen when I get her, I put a piece a little one of those. Uh, uh, Tiny mushroom, uh, mushrooms, tiny uh, marshmallows in with the uh, in the hole, and let them uh, chew chew their way to release her. I I don't have any problem with that at all. That, that is the solid traditional way, and I don't know. I understand too what Kim's talking about leaving them longer. I don't know if that's just based on they're so much harder to to introduce, or if they just cost so much more. I want to be, I want to err toward the side of keeping her alive, whatever it takes. So it's one of those itchy moments that comes along when you do this whole thing. There's been several itchy moments. I want her out as soon as I can get her out, but I want her to be as safely released as possible. So 
kind of get an idea from the cage. If they're just still crazy in the cage and they're clinging to the cage, bees outside, and they're trying to won't let go, you can't shake them off, they may be a little, the least bit stingy. Well, they're not happy with that queen still. So back in the box, she goes for some more time. But if the bees kind of move away and they're fairly gentle, and I were just beginning this, I'd probably puncture that candy plug. We've used the names of candy plugs and three hole cages. And this, this will all be obvious once you actually see this stuff, if you're brand new. I think one of the best tests to do this with, you mentioned the bees clinging to the cage, is to, when you first open the hive, not use smoke, if you can, if you can <clears throat> and very gently blow on the cage. Yeah. And and if if the bees are moving away from the cage when you blow on it, because they're going to move away when you blow on the hive every time anyway. So if they move away from that cage when you blow on it, you can be reasonably sure that they're comfortable with that queen. If they don't move, and they're looking up at you like, "Don't do that again," you might want to think <laughs> twice about 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 uh, releasing her because, uh, like you said, I want her alive, but I want her safe. I like that. Don't use smoke. You, you you really won't need smoke on a package colony three or four days later. It's it's a still pretty much a kitten. They're easy to work. And Kim said in one of the other sessions to use dishwasher gloves or something. That'd be a good time to put on some thinner gloves instead of the heavy gloves that come for beekeeping once you're working big, big hives, just so you can have some agility there and deal with her gently and caressingly so the, so the so the the consensus here is to what to to really kind of watch the bees see how if they're accepting her if, if, if you decide you want to release her what do you do do you just punch a hole through the the candy or take out the cork and install the cage or do you rip off the screen and just dump her into the hive if i were a new beekeeper i'd i would air toward a little bit longer Instead mm -hmm. of punching cages, and I mean, I, you you do that later, but don't do it first time out. Just stay cool. And you mentioned, I st I still punch a hole through the candy. We we have historically done that, Kim. Help me, just yep. because it speeds up that release mm -hmm. a little bit, right? It encourages the workers to both inside and out. It's mainly the outside workers that are eating through the candy, but you don't have to. But it. If we're to that point and we've decided to release her short of just pushing the candy plug out or releasing her directly, I would take a frame nail or twig, put a small hole through that candy plug to encourage them. Well, the other thing that that does <clears throat> is that it, uh, sometimes that candy plug will dry out and get hard. Yeah. And and you'll have <clears throat> bees that won't be able to eat through that candy plug. So so punching that hole in there uh, gives the bees on the outside a, a little uh, better way to get through there. And it makes sure that th that plug isn't dried out and hard and they wouldn't may be able to get through there. So hmm. but I wait. I always right. wait two or three days before I punch that hole. Oh sure, starting beekeeping is exciting, but it can also be daunting. So many choices to make, and you'll want only the best for your bees. You'll have fun researching and buying your equipment, so you need a source of trusted information and supplies readily available to you. Better Bee is your partner in better beekeeping. Whether you're experienced or just beginning, Better Bee has everything you need, including customized beginner kits, Humble Abodes Woodenware, Sheriff Bee Suits, Licensed Stainless Honey House Equipment, Honey Bottles, Containers, and Custom Labels, plus educational books, posters, and more. Let Better Bee help you select what you need through their helpful customer service and informative bee supply catalog. You can trust Better Bee because they are beekeepers serving beekeepers. Find them online at www.betterbee.com. All right, so we have the the queen installed. We have the bees installed. We and so it's time to button them up. We put the inner cover on top, and then you put the cover on top of the hive, and you sit, stand back and and watch them get settled. That's really kind of the one of the ex most exciting times as a new beekeeper is when 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 you have that package installed. Yes. You see them starting to fly, as you said. You see the 
the the bees that have decided that's going to be home. They're out front. They're they're fanning. They're letting everybody know that's their their colony. That's their hive. The bees are starting to settle in, and the, that's a really good time. And they're looking for lunch. Yeah, yeah. you got to get that's you got to really get good. some feed into them. Now, what do you feed them? Well, do do they need to feed them? I would well, feed them. Well, yeah, they. Uh, the food that you're going to give them is what they use to build the wax comb that they're going to live on. So they've got to get going right away. It's going to take a couple, three days for that queen to get released, a couple, three more before she begins laying, and she's got to have some place to lay. And to do that, they got to have food. So if you don't have another hive that you can give them honey from or uh, something like that, you're going to have to give them some sugar water to get them started. How do you do that? Well, if it's a beginner cat they're using... Help me here, Jeff, if I, if I go wrong. But if it's a beginner, a beginner kit, it came with some kind of a feeder. So mm-hmm. whatever it came with, I would use. There's better feeders if it's those feeders that go on the front. There's better feeders than those. But I don't want to suggest that right away you got to go buy different equipment. You can, if you've still got that empty deep that I referred to a bit ago when I released my packages slowly, you can... Just take a common jar with a lid on it and punch a couple of very, very small nail holes in it and prop that up and be sure those holes are exposed to the, where the bees can get to it and they will find it. And they'll yeah. pull those, they'll pull that syrup out of there eagerly. So either use what came with it or if improvise a simple feeder. A chicken watering device can be used as a feeder if you put it inside that empty hive equipment I was referring to a bit ago. Yep, and the, and most beginner kits will have they'll have their second deep avail, deep box available, so that you have that you can put that around any feeder you put on top. the The only thing I would rec- I would caution against is if you make your own feeder, or even if you do a store bought feeder. A lot of them you turn them upside down, and it's it depends on you, or it depends on a vacuum being formed to hold that syrup in uh, the sugar syrup inside. And I've had <laughs> experience where uh, the vacuum didn't hold. Uh-huh. And I come back a week or a, a di- next day, and I see sugar syrup running out the front of the hive, and and everyone's drenched inside, and uh, that's not a happy feeling. Um, so just be careful with the equipment that you use. And so we have the bees. Also, we have our new colony set up. The package is installed. Uh, we've got them fed. The bees are flying around. We're sitting back, admiring admiring our handiwork and and our beekeeping skills. That's a really good feeling. What if you don't have a Langstroth hive? What if you've 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 opted to go with uh, like a top bar hive, Kim? Well, I'll tell you, Jeff. Basically, uh, you're doing the same sort of thing. You're preparing the cavity before you put them in. You're making sure you've got your feeder ready. You're making sure you got all the tools that you need to get the hive open, and and uh, all of, all of that. You don't have to have a hive stand, of course, because the the, the top bar hive basically is its own stand. But what you do want to do, and, and, and I think the recommendation pretty much always is, is you make sure your entrance is on the end, not the middle. And if you bought a top bar hive kit, or if you made yours, one of the things you, that will come with that is that, that uh, piece of wood that, that you put in that, that, makes, that closes off a, par, a portion of the top bar hive. And you want to put that in so that you're about four frames deep. You want to make a cavity that's about four frames deep. You take your top bars off. You install your package just like you do on your on your uh, uh, Langstroth hive. You put your top bars back on, and you put your lid in, and you get your feeder in there. I don't know what kind of feeder. And that can be tricky <laughs> because sometimes uh, you don't have room on the top above your frames to put a to put a feeder, so you're either putting one inside, in which case you'd make a little more room, or you do one of those outside feeders. But you get a feeder in there so that the bees can get at it safely and rapidly. And what you, you're preparing the cavity, you've got the, the top bars with some sort of attractant, usually some beeswax or a starter strip, and the hole on the end, and it's basically the same way. You're putting the queen... Between uh, the top bars, you're securing her up there, probably with something like a twistum. Those work pretty well so that she stays up towards the top and they can get to her. Some put them on the bottom. I don't like that. I just don't like putting a queen on the floor, but that's me. 
So, but the basics are the same. All right. And and I would assume it'd be much the same thing with a long hive. Long hive. Exactly. Exactly. You're gonna make. Yeah. You're gonna just seal off a section so it's smaller than the whole hive is completely, and uh, you handle it just like a Langstroth. How soon should you open the hive up again? Uh, whether you release the queen or not, that's probably the first thing that we're interested in. But how how soon is too soon to open up that colony? Can I say if that if we if we think the queen is out, the cage is gone, and the, everything's the way it should be inside the hive? I tend to leave them alone for a week, ten days. Even though I want to go check on them, I just let them take on their sense of self. And they come. I would give gently open it, minimal to no smoke. And if I can see eggs one time, I can see eggs anywhere in there, or ideally see the queen. Put that colony back together and go do something else. And let them establish that she's not fully accepted until she's got a, some of her own brood really going nicely there. That's me. What's you? Well, you hit a couple of good spots there. One of them is uh, patience, which is at that time of my beekeeping life is pretty much impossible. I want to be there tomorrow, <laughs> maybe yet later this afternoon, let alone wait a week. But I. The two things that are going on is if you're opening up that colony, you're disturbing the process, you're disturbing the system that they're beginning to set up. And too often they will take that disturbance out on the queen and they will they will kill the queen because things aren't normal and quiet and calm. So you're taking that chance there. The other thing is, as you said, um, <clears throat> I'm going to wait, no smoke if I can avoid it, and look for eggs. You and I aren't spring chickens anymore. Do you see eggs really well? There's delightful appliances that will augment my <laughs> failing body parts. And in this case, I will stoop to using magnifying glasses and these delightful little digital flashlights. So I do whatever oh. it takes to see. The other thing to try and take a look is uh, the, the glasses that skiers use that are, have a yellow tint to them. They make eggs stand mm. right out for me. So really, yeah, really. So hadn't any, tried that. Any of those things work if you can't see an egg at the bottom of a cell, and you know you got to stand so the sun's behind you and shining down over your shoulder into the bottom of the cell. And if you can't see them, then try one of those uh, appliances, as you put it, and see if that helps. And once you see a, a pattern of eggs, then you know that life is in that colony beginning to be normal and going in the direction it should, I think. Yeah, I think uh, I, I, I agree. And, and the other thing is, is, is the sound of the colony uh, is you'll develop a sense for it. But when they're happy, they're, it's a nice, gentle hum. And, 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 and you, it, it's kind of a comforting sound um, once you get used to it. And, and if they're unhappy if the queen is not producing if if something else is going on it'll have a different tone and um just you as a beekeeper you become in tune to to a lot the smells the sounds the, not only the sights something to think about as you're looking at your colony what do you what are we looking for in that first month the first two months i have this equipment when do i install the next brood chamber the next section of hive you want to guess first, Kim? You want me to guess, or you want to make? <laughs> well, my my, I, I, I try not to guess on this one. Uh, the 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 books will tell you, and and your beginner class is going to tell you is when you've got comb being drawn on four to six of the frames in that first box. It's time to add the second box, and that's a rule of thumb, and that's what it is. It's a rule of thumb. If you're going to be gone and you've got to, they're not quite there yet, you might want to get it on earlier. If, if you're able to look at that hive every couple of days, you might be able to wait a little bit longer. But when you've got some comb on four to six of the middle frames in that bottom box, you can reasonably be assured that it's time to add the second one, in my experience. Is that the same, the same rule of thought with an eight-frame hive? Good question, and it is. Four to six frames, and... and, and, and it has less to do with the number of frames in the box than the number of frames that are covered, because that it, there's, it's sort of a sort of a uh, um, what's the word I want? 
it, it, it's sort of a measurement of the of the ambitiousness of the colony to get those four to six frames covered, as opposed to how many frames are there anyway. So if there's six frames, you want six covered. If there's ten frames, I still want four to six covered. That makes sense. Yes, to me. If I guess if you got to make a mistake. Make the error on putting the space, the extra equipment on too soon. I'd rather you put it on too soon than wait till they're, they're already drawn out to eight or frames or so. And by then you've missed a bit of the honey crop because I would think you're in the middle of your nectar flow too at that time. Do the best you can do. That's all you can do. Do what you can do. All right. What What else should we watch for in the next, in the ne that first week, uh, the first month, the first two months? Kim, can I say I want you to watch that queen? I don't trust her. <laughs> I don't trust her at all because I want to know the day that she first begins to feel badly because to get a replacement queen, first of all, contact your mentor, contact someone and see if they agree that something's not right here. But I want to know the condition of the queen in that first month. Nice brood pattern failed out. Everything looks uh, good. The sounds that Jeff talked about, good aroma. Nectar pours on your feet when you turn the frame sideways. Those are all good signs. But if that colony is not building up, you can't readily see eggs and cat brood. Uh, well, there is a question, Jim, and it's one that I hear a lot. You mentioned cat brood. How much cat brood should I be seeing after a month? After, a, oh, I can't guess at that, Kim. I'd want to see a frame or two, you know, but not like full frames, like, the center parts of those frames, I want to be able to readily find cap brood. And if you mm -hmm. pin me down, I guess, I don't know, half a frame or so, three-fifths of a frame on two or three different sides. And then I want to see big larvae that I can see. And then I want to see that little pollen band around it. I want to try to think that everything's in sync there because seasons are going to vary. Queen's productivities are going to vary too rainy. I don't, I don't know. So they're, there may not be a reason why I can look for a specific amount of brood at that time. Well, one of the things to think about here is actually the length of each of the cycles that are going through. Once that queen starts laying, which is going to be, if you're lucky, a couple days. If, if the weather is not cooperative, it may be as much as a week before she starts laying. The first eggs that she lays is going to be, they're not going to cap them for three weeks, right? Right. So yeah. if you go in there after a month, you've got a week's worth of capped brood. The first week that she was laying of capped brood, it's not going to be very much. Right. Uh, Especially it, if they had to pull the foundation. If, yep. if, if you started them on foundation and yeah, those so, are had to wait. Points. Good points. So after that first month, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for capped brood. It's nice if I see it. What I'm looking for is a lot of larva. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and, by then, they're big enough that I don't need those devices to see them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but that's what I'm looking. I'm looking for a lot of larva, and a queen can lay an egg, and larva can develop in a in a not fully developed cell. It doesn't have to be as deep as it's going to be eventually. They they get mm -hmm. started in a hurry. So I'm looking for larva more than cap brood, but some cap brood too. This has been really good. We've we've taken our listeners from from setting up the yard, uh, uh, setting up the equipment, choosing the equipment, setting up the equipment. They've received their their bees. We've talked about uh, how you, how you get that package started in the in the hive. Got the queen set up, and and the the bees established and getting them going in the first couple months. I think it's 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 been a good episode. On our next and last episode, we're going to talk about the rest of the season as a beekeeper. We're going to talk about some of the growth, uh, some of the common problems you could you can see. We'll touch on the pests and diseases, and that's a that's that's a whole bunch all by itself. But we'll we'll talk about some of the big hitters that you'll definitely be hearing in your monthly beekeeping meetings and be reading in your uh, magazine, such as Bee Culture Magazine. Uh, and we'll have uh, so we'll talk about that and wrap up the series uh, at the end of next episode and you'll find if you look at the show notes you can find our recommendations for books uh, some YouTube videos and some uh, national or some classes online that you can 
you can uh, follow up with. Yeah, I got to add one thing here, yeah. Jeff. Not only Bee Culture magazine, but the other magazine that they produce. It's called Beekeeping Your First Three Years. And it's aimed right at that group of people. It's the people that are still trying to figure out which end of a hive tool to use, all the way up to harvesting after their third season. Good articles, good good photographs, and not to mention a, a book I know of. That, what's what's the name of that one book you wrote? <laughs> the Backyard Beekeeper. That, that's right. what that's Thank aimed you. at. And Jim, your your beginning book. Mine's more of a question and answer and hypothetical situation. I have to say that yours is more of a useful text for someone who's just starting out. But I think that the, 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 the question and answer is really good too, because as beekeepers, I think we always have questions that we're looking answers for answers. I, I'd recommend you looking at both of those books and find those links in our show notes. Well, that about wraps up this podcast. Before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts or wherever you download and stream the show. Your vote helps other beekeepers find us quicker. We want to thank our series sponsors, Better Bee, for sponsoring this four-part series on how to get started keeping bees. As always, we also want to thank Bee Culture, the magazine for American beekeeping, for their sponsorship of Beekeeping Today podcast in 2020. We want to thank our regular episode sponsor, Global Patties. Check them out at www.globalpatties.com. And finally, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today podcast listener, for joining us on this show. Feel free to send us questions and comments at questions at beekeepingtodaypodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. Anything else, guys? Not from me. I'm done. Yeah, I think we've uh, covered enough today, Jeff. All right, I'm going to go out and look at the bees while it's sunny. (laughs) Thanks a lot, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.